some things are so uh, ubiquitous, so much a part of life that um, they're easily taken for granted. The force of numbers is one of those things. Small groups are more capable than individuals. Uh, large groups are more capable than, than small groups. So human beings band together because doing so allows them to, um, su to survive, to eat, uh, find shelter, defend themselves in a way that they couldn't do as isolated individuals or even as extended uh, family groups. So the question I want to ask uh, today is how far do, do the benefits of scale uh, reach? And I think the answer is um, very far um, indeed. And the reasons for this take us to the heart of politics. They take us to the heart of why we have governments um, at all. Government essentially provides goods that we cannot get through informal cooperation. And there are two fundamental features of such groups that I want to um, analyse and then um, engage uh, the uh, implications. And the first of these is non-rivalness. When you consume it, you don't deplete it. What are these goods? Well, they are they're vast and wide-ranging. Uh, the rule of law, including the judicial system and, indeed, um, law itself. If you have a law, you consume the law in the context of the society and the behaviour of individuals within it. But, of course, the law itself is not um, consumed. It's not rival. The consumption of one person does not limit its consumption by another the financial system is another example. Perhaps most important of all, external defence and internal security. Uh, public health, including particularly pandemic uh, prevention. And one might say as a kind of a summary good, public good, civilization um, itself. And here I think one can talk about a law, a law of politics, the law of scale. If my consumption does not diminish your consumption, then more people, then the more people who contribute to producing it, the cheaper it is for each of us. So that's the first principle, non-rivalness. The second is non-excludability. The fact that a good, a public good is inclusive. Once it's provided, it's available to all. It cannot be metered or it cannot be effectively metered. You can't charge individuals for their particular use of that, um, that good. And what does this do? It raises the free rider dilemma. It means that individuals who do not pay for the good can still get uh, the benefit without uh, paying for it. So what we have here is a combination of characteristics non-rivalry, non which produces the principle of scale, and non-excludability, which produces the free rider dilemma. And you put these together. Now, it may well be possible to overcome the free rider dilemma in a small group. Their norms can be, um, can be um, terribly effective, uh, given the characteristics of that group, the extent to which they share and feel that they share a common um, fate that brings them to conceive of their relationships as reciprocal. But in the context of non-rivalness, non-excludability really poses the need for some kind of overarching authority, precisely that provided by government. So I think one can say in the context of this frame is that Scale is intrinsic to government, and government is intrinsic to scale. Now, I've talked about two principles, excludability and rivalness. What happens when we put these together and look at the various um, alternatives? And I think it's a very meaningful um, way of thinking about the goods that we can achieve both as individuals and collectively. Most goods are, are private goods. These are goods that are excludable and rival. That is, potential users can be 
excluded from the benefits and consumption reduces their use. These are the goods that are the fulcrum of economics as a, uh, as a discipline. And they encompass the wide range of, of, of goods that we use as individuals, consumables, including food and shelter. So these are fundamental to human um, existence. Um, private possessions that use up whenever you use them. Um, club goods to the right is a combination of non-rivalness, but also excludability. So the utility of the good is not diminished by consumption, but its benefits can be restricted to a group. And that means that club goods can be privately pr provided. What do they include? Well, the normal examples are cinemas and private parks, which are um, non-rival up to a degree. That is to say, if a private park has, a small private park has a thousand users, then there would be some rivalness that would be, um, that would start to appear and affect the use of the, of the park and the utility that individuals gain from visiting the park. Um, there are other examples too um, that um, relate to the digital age. Information databases are excludable but non-rival. You don't use them up and when, when, you, uh, when you use them um, and yet it's possible to meter their use so that individuals who use them pay for them. Cable television is another example. Computer programs would be um, another example yet. What about common pool groups on the left at the bottom? These are non-excludable, uh, but rival. Everyone has free access to them, but the more people use them, the less there is for others. And what are these kinds of goods? Well, these are often the goods available in, in nature, um, such as fishing stocks, um, pasture, uh, mineral resources like coal or oil, um, natural resources growing on the land, timber. So these are non-excludable but finite. Now here there's a set of possibilities uh, that are much more present than when a good is non uh, is non uh, finite, when it's non um, rival. And that is they don't involve the logic of scale. And there is the possibility of ma mandating the use of a common pool uh, good in a small N setting, in the setting of a community. And that is precisely the line taken by Eleanor Ostrom in her famous book, really a Nobel Prize winning a project on governing the commons, in which she shows in one example after the other that communities by virtue of their norms and the way in which they um, institute their norms make it possible for natural um, um, potentials, for natural resources to be controlled uh, sensibly, rationally in the context of particular groups of individuals living in communities. What you see next is the front piece of, a, of the first book that really laid out the logic of um, public goods and that is The Leviathan by Thomas um, Hobbes. And you can actually see the Leviathan um, at the top of the, um, of, of the front piece. That is this combination of individuals, a, a regime, a, a monarchy, which is made up of the individuals in that a society. So the Leviathan is a public good that embodies the population. What is the public good that Hobbes has in mind? It is security. Because based on the realization that if individuals did not produce this public good, life would be nasty, brutish and short in his famous phrase. And so we're providing security by virtue of having a government that enforces security within a um, society. And so this is a good, going back to public goods, that is non-rival, when you consume it, you don't deplete it, and non-excludable, once produced, it is available for all.
And if you look below, it's quite interesting, if you look below, um, the two sides of the triptych um, reflect the sword and the crozier, earthly power on the left, and the power of the church on the right. And the giant, the Leviathan, holds the symbols of both sides, reflecting the union of the secular and the church. Well, what I'd like to do now is to engage what are the main features of public goods and how this relates to um, scale, because scale is present in um, each one of these. And the first I'd like to uh, mention is trade and production. And here there are several ways in which scale plays a role in creating efficiency. In the first place, it um, reduces transaction costs. The larger a jurisdiction, the greater the benefit of a system of law um, regarding uh, contracts, the contracts between the seller um, and the buyer, and hence reducing the trans the uh, transaction cost um, of exchange. The same applies to weights and measures. If you have a common system of weights and measures across a trade, so much the better for the buyers and the sellers because they have a common system of measurement that reduces their transaction costs. Um, there are other benefits too. Um, one is comparative advantage. Large Trading regimes, large polities, uh, make it possible to gain the benefits of specialization. Where you have a diverse productive scenario, um, individuals and corporations, firms, can focus on what they do best and thus gain the benefits of specialization, the gains from trade. And this is um, the point of departure for international um, economics. And then finally, um, economies of scale, um, as you see in this um, slide. What you have is a situation in which greater production, the greater extent of production, can bring down the unit cost. And so the average cost of producing um, the good uh, decreases with the scale of production, as in the shift from A to B in this um, slide. Now, it's always possible that you get diseconomies of scale. I mean, that is the normal way that an economist would conceive of this. It may be possible that a factory is, is too large. The cost of, um, of communication may um, increase such that the average cost of the product increases as the scale increases. But think about this from the standpoint of um, public good um, economists. A public good is, um, not, is, not, is immaterial and so it's much more difficult to conceive of situations where there are substantial um, diseconomies. Take for example the um, taxation. A taxation regime can cover an entire area and the larger the population covered the less it would cost um, per person. Um, defence procurement is another, um, I think, very um, interesting example because one of the things that one thinks about in defence procurement uh, that comes to mind is the, um, the contrast between the European Union and the United States and the benefits of scale in the United States compared to the fragmentation of the European Union with respect to defence spending and defence uh, procurement, the procurement of the weapons of, of, um, of war. In 2018, 2018 dollars, the United States spent 44.5 billion. The European Union spent 26.4 billion, which is almost 60% of the spending of the United States. And what did the, what did the EU get for that? Well, vastly less than half vastly less than half of the defence capability of the United States. When you're producing a series of tanks, when each country wants to have its own defence procurement industry, where the standards of the weapons that are being produced vary, when you have the complexity of bringing these together in a coherent military structure, 
all of these are costs and they're all costs that are produced that come out of the fact that the European Union, while it operates and gains the benefits of scale in economic trade, it does not do so in military uh, procurement. Another major heading in terms of the benefits of scale is um, insurance. Scale can provide insurance against disaster. If a polity is, is large enough, um, it can assist those um, suffering from flood or um, earthquake or famine by mobilizing the resources of people in areas not affected. And so the larger the scale of the polity, the greater the likelihood that this disaster, a disaster that um, is met uh, by the population in that polity, will not uh, be met by all others. And therefore you can have some redistribution, some insurance against disaster. And this applies um, also to exogenous economic shocks. So in a very large polity, it may well be the case that a recession doesn't hit all of the regions of that polity at the same time. And so by virtue of the tax system, uh, income tax system and much else besides, there can be some support, some redistribution from areas not so hard hit to those that are hit. Um, the same applies or should apply in a pandemic. That is to say, if the pandemic hits certain regions of the country at different times, then the resources that are necessary to deal with the pandemic, so for example, including um, with COVID-19 uh, ventilators, could be used sequentially in the areas that are um, hit at particular uh, times. So all of these are examples of risk pooling. And here one has the law of large numbers. The larger the numbers, the more effective risk pooling uh, becomes. Um, thirdly, a scale internalizes um, externalities. Now that is a bit of jargon, and what does it mean? Well, externality, externalities are a core concept in economics. An externality is the uh, cost or benefit that affects a third party who did not choose to incur that cost or benefit. So, collective decision-making allows all those who may be affected um, to actually play a part, play a role in the decision-making procedure um, itself. Where does this matter? Well, um, one common example is uh, pollution. Imagine that you have two countries neighbouring each other, two small countries neighbouring each other, where the air... Um, of one is also the air that is breathed by the population of the um, other. And imagine also that they have different preferences or different policies with regard to pollution, air pollution. Well, what would be the point of one small country, say Belgium vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Netherlands, if Belgium had a policy restraining its pollution? Um, the Netherlands did not. It's an imaginary example. Um, and the air from the Netherlands went to Belgium. Wouldn't it be much more sensible, more rational in terms of um, decision making that they, the two countries shared uh, decision making where they actually looked at each other in the eye and said, OK, we both suffer from this. The activities of one have an effect on the other and therefore we should make a common set of decisions regarding this collective um, bad. Um, a tariff is another example. If a tariff can help industry in one country, it may hurt exports to the industry in another country. And although it may be good for country A to impose tariffs, maybe the gross effect, the overall effect of imposing that tariff would be negative for the two countries combined. That actually is an argument for precisely European integration, where you can make those common decisions regarding the constraints on um, trade. So there are a number of different ways in which the behaviour, the policies of one country affect those um, in another. And when markets ignore the non-price effects of the market, we talk about market failure. 
And here I'm suggesting that there's a, another kind of dimension of failure, and that's governance failure. When the policies or behaviour of individuals in one country affect those in, the, in another, and those effects are not taken into account in the decision-making of the first country. <clears throat> nuclear plants, the location of nuclear plants is another rather striking example, as you see in this slide. And what you find for nuclear plants is if a country does not wish to bear all bear the brunt of a nuclear meltdown, what will it do? Well, to the extent that the effects are local, they're spatial, so that country will tend to put its nuclear plants on the borders of the country. And you see that here in several countries. Um, and in many cases where that border is um, on the sea, the nuclear plants are put close to the sea, as is patently the case uh, for, uh, for Sweden. But sometimes there are countries next door that have to share the brunt of a nuclear plant that doesn't serve that country, and where the country that's maybe receiving the uh, negative effect has no role in the placement of that nuclear plant. Just look at Ukraine, for example, and the country directly north of the Ukraine, uh, Belarus, has a series actually of, of nuclear plants near to its borders, even though it has no nuclear capacity um, itself. Um, and finally, the fourth kind of major area in which scale really matters is power um, itself. Scale is fundamental to uh, political power. By encompassing a greater number of people, larger jurisdictions command more resources and can exert uh, more power. So it's not surprising that history is uh, replete with instances in which big states swallow, uh, bully or steal from small states. Now, we're used to thinking about the exceptions um, to this uh, principle. And the exceptions attract our attention uh, because they confirm that um, bullies are not invulnerable and that an underdog can um, defy the odds. The history that I learned as a youngster in Britain was um, infused with the image of um, Britain's uh, defiance of Nazi Germany in the Battle of Britain, which is rather like an updated version of uh, the 300 Spartans, a uh, delaying a vastly larger uh, Persian army at uh, Th uh, Thermopylae. But these are powerful images precisely because they cut against the grain. They happen because a larger power is um, unable to bring its full weight to bear on a, uh, because of, for example, a, a narrow pass or a protective band of water, as in the case of the uh, English Channel, which meant that the German fighters and bombers could only sortie over, over England for a, a, shorter, uh, a shorter time, whereas the, the uh, Spitfires and the Hurricanes that were based in England could sortie for a much longer uh, period of time. So when a smaller power defeats a larger, it's usually because the smaller power has some um, offsetting advantage, not because it is um, intrinsically small. Um, as uh, Damon Runyon joked, um, the race is not always to the swift, and the race is not always to the strong, but that's how the smart money bets. I'd like now to um, briefly discuss two examples where scale really matters. As you probably know, the main battles in the Second World War were fought in the East, between, between Germany and Russia. And on the face of it, things could not have been worse for, for Russia. The initial German onslaught, Barbarossa, uh, from late June 1941, inflicted around five million casualties on, on the Russian uh, Soviet army. And the Germans had lost perhaps one-fifth of that, perhaps one million. And then came in the next year, from August 1942, the battle for Stalingrad. And this was 
a battle in which the Soviets um, won. And not only did they win, but they captured um, 235,000 German and um, Axis troops at the end of that a battle in February of, of uh, early February of 1943. But when you look at actually the losses in the battle, again, you see that Russia had and the Soviet Union had lost a, um, a greater amount of manpower uh, than had the Germans, um, perhaps 50% more, um, perhaps even uh, double. The numbers are, are difficult to, uh, to, to, to uh, estimate, um, but you're talking about 650 to a million uh, German casualties and well over, well over a million and perhaps 1.2 or even more casualties for the, uh, the Soviets. And their, and their allies. So the turning point of World War II was a battle that had cost the Soviets greater losses than uh, the Germans, even including the captured uh, German and Axis uh, troops. And then finally, um, the Battle of Kursk, which was the greatest tank battle in World War II, took place in the summer of 1943. Um, German casualties, looking at the, at the statistics, the horrifying statistics, German casualties were around 200,000. Russian um, casualties were around four times as great, around 850,000 people killed or wounded. Um, they lost the, the Russians lost six times as many tanks and guns, eight times as many aircraft. What you see in the slide is that the extent to which the Soviet Union mobilized its population rapidly increased. At first, the Soviets were outnumbered by the Germans, but by the time of the Battle of Kursk, um, the Soviets had mobilized six million men in, their, in uh, their army. And while it's absolutely true that there were a whole series of other factors that led to the Soviet a victory, um, the T-34 tank and its production being one, or the harshness of the Russian winter being um, also a decisive fa a factor. But the sheer scale, the Russian population being about twice that of a greater a Germany, was absolutely crucial for the Soviets to take such huge losses and come out eventually ahead while they were losing a greater share of their army, a greater number of individuals as casualties than were the Germans in the critical, uh, decisive um, conflicts. So here we're not simply talking about um, the economies of scale. An economy of scale decreases the average cost of a product as the scale of production increases. When one's engaged in conflict, it's not the relative price, but the absolute amount that can be produced, even if the cost of producing each unit um, increases. That's the difference in a way between the economics of scale and the politics of scale. If you're engaged in a struggle with one society against the other, the absolute amount, the absolute production is what can be, uh, can be crucial. And I want to finish with a slide that suggests how both the size of the economy and the size of the polity, the scale of the polity, can both catapult a state into great power a status. And here you see China, which has a lower per capita GDP than many of the states um, around it. It is um, a barely... Um, one quarter the per capita GDP of Japan, um, less than a third that of South Korea, considerably smaller, less than half that of Taiwan. But what distinguishes China, what makes China so powerful, both as an economy and as a polity and as a state, is its sheer scale. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm actually posing a puzzle. All of these reasons, 
the nature of the public goods, the diversity of the public goods that really uh, matter, the extent to which scale is so fundamental to the performance of those public goods um, raises a fundamental puzzle, and that is, why don't we see more of it? Why don't we see larger states um, for the median? Why don't we see much more scale than we actually see on this uh, planet? And that is the puzzle that we will be engaging in the next several lectures.